chapter 9. If you would, skip all the way down to verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord God, for your words, because your words speak truth, they speak correction, they speak life. And so, Father, we ask even now, Lord God, that you administer to each and every one of us. Regardless of how we have come to this service today, Lord God, we pray, Father, Lord God, that you have your way in our lives. And so, Father, we ask right now that you would make of us, Lord God, what you want. And Father, for everything that is said and done, may you and you alone receive all praise, glory, and honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. Look to your neighbors. I am counting the cost. <laughs> you may be seated. When Julius Caesar's governorship ended, he was given orders to disband his army and to report to Rome. He was given explicit orders not to take his army into Rome. In fact, it was law, Roman law stated that no one could take their army. No army was allowed to go past that, the, the, the Rubicon River. That was the border. And so, from the northern of, of Italy. And so, Caesar, looking at this, knowing that if he crossed that river, the Rubicon, with his army, there was no going back. And so, he looked at that in January of 49 BC and he crossed the Rubicon at that moment he did he knew that there was no going back he knew the moment he did that it would plunge Rome into a civil war and that's exactly what took place in the end Rome was never called a Roman Republic anymore but a Roman Empire and Julius it's Caesar he would become emperor. It's interesting because we understand, we probably heard crossing the Rubicon, but that's what it was meant. It was meant a point of no return. And there are situations in our own lives, choices that we make that put us into a position of no return. It's that metaphor, right? A point of no return is a fixed point in your life. And you could see them. These are decisions that we made throughout our lives that once we made those decisions, we knew that our life was going to be dramatically different. That it wasn't going to be the same. This is how Jesus expects us to live our lives for him, believe it or not. Taking a look at our passage this morning. He was asking for anyone who followed him to go to another level. To follow him and not look back. It's interesting because you have to get Jesus' mindset here. He comes across these three that we know of. There may have been more, but the apostle didn't write them down. But as we go through, and Jesus is now, if you just take a look at about maybe five verses before, take a look at his mindset here. Before he met them, this is what's going through his mind. In verse in Luke, just five verses before it, in 51, it says this, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. There was a point in time in Jesus' life that he realized, this is it. 
at this point, I need to go to Jerusalem. He was in Galilee. And he set his face to Jerusalem. In other words, he resolutely, he was determined. He wasn't going to change his mind. He said, this is it. And it even goes far. Others know them. It says in verse 52, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him. Why? Because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. He was so focused at that point of what was going on in Jerusalem. His, that was his final destination. Something sparked in Jesus in that final trip that said, everything that I've been ministering to for the last couple of years has led me to this point, and the time has now come. He could have stayed in Galilee, but he didn't. He set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem, never veering, going all the way to the cross. So these gentlemen that come across his path, that's Jesus' mindset. That's what he's doing. He is so determined that the Samaritans wouldn't even allow him to stay in because he was heading off to Jerusalem. And here they come, and they say, hey, listen, here we are. And this is Jesus' mindset, so keep that in mind. He is making the ultimate sacrifice. He is completely committed. So when people come to him and talk to him about being committed, he challenges them. But he challenges us today, doesn't he? In our passage this morning, we're told of three potential followers of Jesus. The first, we're told that as they were walking, after Jesus is in this mindset, going directly to Jerusalem, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responds, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This is an emotional decision on the part of this man. He saw Jesus and he was so emotional. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus challenged that. This emotional decision lacked depth, lacked conviction, and forethought. And it's interesting. This is the type of person that said they're going to follow Jesus. But when they are challenged... At the first sign of discomfort, they begin to get a little wishy-washy. And let me tell you something, being a Christian is going to be filled with a lot of situations and challenges in your life that will cause you to become discomfort, that will cause discomfort in your life. And remember what Jesus said, hey, you know, foxes have holes, right? There's no place to call home. This isn't really our home anyway. But this man was excited to follow Jesus. Perhaps he heard him teach one day. Perhaps he was witnessing the miracles that Jesus was performing. Re regardless of what it was, it wasn't given much thought because Jesus challenges in that moment. You see, when we make those kind of decisions to follow Jesus, we can be excited about our, about our salvation in that moment. We can be excited about our church in that moment. But when discomfort comes, when we are challenged, do we turn our back on God? Do we turn our back and just leave and up and go to another church or whatever it might be? Disband or whatever it may be. There's so many challenges. You see, the problem is about excitement is that that wears off, doesn't it? And commitment can wane when the road is exhausting and there's nowhere to lay your head. Nowhere for rest. This is what Jesus was talking about. Where was he going to lay his head? It wasn't an actual having something to lay. It was like no, having no home. He knew that death awaited him. But rest? I don't know if he got a lot of rest. We do know that he prayed so much on the night that they came to take him that he sweat blood. We do know that whole turmoil, everything, when they come and arrest him, and everything that transpires, 
And so, no. You know, it's interesting. In John 6, 60, it says this. On hearing it, and this is hearing the teaching of Jesus, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? It was just a hard teaching, and they, they couldn't wrap their minds around it, and they decided, you know, this is just not for me. And many begin to leave. In fact, we're told, if you skip down to verse 66, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. It was too tough. See, the excitement was waning. That commitment it was just not, you know, I don't know how far I can be committed. I don't understand this. What's going on? And many left Jesus that day. And it's interesting, they left Jesus even after seeing many miracles, including him walking on water and feeding 5,000 people. With just a, a few loaves and fishes. And yet over 5,000 people were fed. Amazing. So Jesus says, yeah, you're going to follow me wherever I go. Let me tell you, the road can be difficult, but at least the foxes have holes and birds have nests. And he's saying it knowing what's awaiting him. Jesus is only on a one-way ticket. He's not going to return to Galilee. He leaves Galilee. He's not coming back. Everywhere he goes from that moment on is his last. That's it. He continues all the way to the cross. In 2 Timothy 3.12 it says this, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We need to know of that commitment, make that commitment, understand it, and be resolute as Jesus was, because that's the same commitment he requires from us. In 1 John 3.13 it says this, Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. In other words, it's going to get difficult. There's going to be trials. There's going to be persecutions. Life may not turn out the way you may have expected it to. And some have given up on God or even just doing what is the right thing to do because they say that this life is just too difficult. And John 12, 27 says this, Now my heart is troubled. Jesus said, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Think about that, that determination. He wasn't even going to ask, he said. Am I going to say, hey, listen, save me from this hour? No. He would pray if it's your will, because he did. But your will be done. Not his, his complete obedience. And we follow, we go along. That was the first man. We don't have any commitment to say, okay, yes, I'm right with you, Jesus. No, we have no recollect, we have nothing written to say that he just jumped in and said, okay, I'm with you. That silence probably speaks that he didn't follow. And so in verse 59, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This is divided devotion. This man is divided of what he should do. Should I follow? Should I go back and take care of what is necessary in my life, my family. And here Jesus, uh, you have to understand, Jesus is the one that's asking this man. Interesting, because the first one, this man just comes up to Jesus and says, hey, listen, I'll follow you. I'll go wherever you, wherever you go. I'll be right there with you, Jesus. But this man, Jesus sees something in him, enough to ask him to follow him, to change your life, change your destiny. Change whatever's going to be. Follow me. And he gives an excuse instead. And it's interesting because God has seen something in each and every one of us, hasn't he? 
He knows how the plan can be marked out in your life. He knows the plans for you, to prosper you, right? He knows those things, and so he's got a plan for you. This is why when Jesus is telling him, listen, let the dead bury the dead. You know, bury their own dead. Come, follow me. Watch what will happen in your life. But you don't get to see that kind of a change take place if you never cross the Rubicon. If you never sit there and say, yes, I'm going to follow you no matter what. That's what was missing. And just so we're clear here, Jesus wasn't forbidding this man to attend his father's funeral. That's not what, it, that's not what is going on here. Basically what is happening is the man is saying that He's going to have to take care of his dad until he passes. So let me bury my dad first. You know, so let me wait for him to pass and then I'll follow you. That's what is going on. Maybe he's the oldest son and he's got, you know, got to look after the will or something like that. Maybe there's all these things that are going on. But in the end, it was a delay. In the end, he was not ready to make that decision and to follow him. His excuse was based on difference of priority. This is why Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, and that you follow me. You don't have to delay it. If God is calling you, if God is saying, follow me, it's going to cost something, but we follow him nonetheless. In Matthew 6, 24, it says this, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And here's the interesting thing. Even though Jesus is talking about money here, isn't the principles, aren't the principles still the same? You can't serve two masters. You're going to have to make a choice. Because these masters will be in conflict at one time or another. And so we need to make that sacrifice. And then the third person. In verse 61, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. This is the person who is distracted. Become distracted by so many ties of this world. Looking back, anyone who puts their hand to a plow and continues to plow and begins to look back, you know you're not going to have a straight line. That line that you're supposed to be sowing seeds is going to be all crooked because you're looking back. It's no different than maybe texting and driving. If you're going to sit there and try to text while driving, guarantee you, you're going to be sw swerving in that lane, maybe jumping over lanes, causing an accident or anything else. That's just what happens. So there's no different from this man putting his hands to the plow and marching on and looking back. Where do you think he's going to be going? He can't do it. He can't keep on that straight and narrow. Life becomes a little crooked, doesn't it? Filled with all sorts of detours. And God is saying, put your hands to the plow and continue to look forward. The one who plows and looks back is not totally committed to the task at hand, is he? He's distracted. He's looking somewhere else. No different than someone who is driving and texting. They're not completely devoted to driving, but they're texting while driving. And you need to be doing one thing at that time. It's like Lot's wife. She couldn't help herself but look back. And when she did, what happened? When she looked back, we know the story, how it goes. She became a pillar of salt. That's the one thing that the angel said. You know, go and don't look back. As long as you were going forward... They were free from any kind of judgment, free from what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. Just don't look back. But she could not help it. There was something that drew her backwards, a tie, something. And sometimes it could be things that we make a bad choice and we feel guilty of. And we sit there and say, you know what? I'm just having a hard time not looking back. I'm reliving that again. Yet you've tried to move on. Listen, at some point in time, you've got to accept that forgiveness from God and continue to move on. If you will not accept the forgiveness of God, you're going to be looking back all the time. 
You're going to be replaying it and reliving it over and over again. God's saying, you put your hand to the plow and you continue to move forward. Don't be distracted. If you have done something that is wrong, you ask for forgiveness and you move on. Put your hand to the plow. Continue to move forward. Refuse to look back because it's the draw is too, can be too much. It could be a prior life. It could be whatever it might be. If we leave those bridges open, we will cross them eventually. It provides a temptation to look back. You know, you think about this. This man said, I want to go and say goodbye to my family. You think about that. What would probably have happened? He'd go back, say goodbye to his family. He said, why are you leaving us? You can't be leaving us. Brother, where are you going? <laughs> right, whatever it may be. We need you here. We have to have this. We've got to do this. You know, and no, the commitment is such that yes, we go on. And I am not talking about <laughs> divorcing and moving on. That's not what Jesus is saying. Anything like that, you would be going together. This is something different. But the commitment is such that you are willing to sacrifice. How many people have been ostracized from their families because they decided to follow Jesus? How many have left the Muslim faith and became a Christian and they became ostracized? There was a lot that they lost. Those that left Jehovah Witnesses and became a, a Christian. Those that leave, whatever it may be, and they get that ostracization from family, friends, and everyone else. Maybe some people that they knew for, for, for such a long time, their entire life, and all of a sudden they won't even talk to them. This happens time and time again, but this is a kind of commitment to follow him. This life is full of distractions and inconsistencies. But God is asking us to be fully committed. So now you have these three different scenarios, these three different people, and Jesus is resolutely going toward the cross. He is not deterring. So when people are saying, uh, you know, uh, you go, uh, you know, uh, are you going to follow me? You know, Jesus is asking them, or he said, I'll follow you, or whatever it may be that's going on. There's a certain commitment because Jesus was completely sold out. I hear this phrase from time to time, and I've said this before. I'm all in, Pastor. I'm all in. And how all in are we? I'm all in. I hope that's true. So these are those three commitments that are, these three scenarios that we see. And Jesus is up in the ante, every situation. It's no different than us. How committed are we to follow Jesus? But here's the question that, has, that still remains, has not been answered. Is it worth following Jesus? Is it worth it? If I'm going to make that kind of commitment, is it worth following him? Serving Jesus isn't just about sacrifice. It will exact that. But it isn't only about that. It's about living the life we were always meant to live. Think about that. Look at the benefits of life that, that Jesus gives us by following him. We're given an abundant life. In John 10.10 10, it says, The thief comes only in order to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it to what? Have it in, and this is the Amplified, and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. This is what God wants in your life. Till it overflows. This is the abundant life. This is what he wants. He says, listen, you commit yourself to me. I will give you life. And not just any kind of life. I will give it to you to the full. Fullness of life. You can't get that but from the author of life. And so follow him. Be committed and see what happens. Following Jesus, it's a life filled with unspeakable joy. And we're not just talking about being happy. Happiness is a, is, is, happens on a moment. 
We could be happy today and sad tomorrow. We could be happy this moment and sad in the next moment. But joy, that can't be taken from you. That is yours. That's what God gives. In John 15, 11, it says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Complete. Lacking nothing. Jesus said, hey, listen, you follow me. <laughs> my joy that I have, and here's the person that was going to the cross, would have his beard plucked out, would be whipped, just brought to the point of death, but not allowed to die, then, able, then had to carry his own cross, go to the cross, die on the cross, cru be crucified for each and every one of us, and who can speak of the torment that he would face spiritually? And in all of that, he's saying, that's the joy. I don't, I've never lost that joy. Which is probably why you could say from that cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because someone who is bitter can't say that. He never had that. He had that joy and he gives it to us. That's one of the benefits of following Jesus. In Acts 13, 52, it says this, and the disciples were filled with joy and with what? The Holy Spirit. They were filled. We're given the Holy Spirit. We're given that joy. And it can't be taken from you. It has nothing to do with the circumstances. You can have that joy. There, you think about this. Think about all the people that lived for Jesus at one point, but are no longer living for Jesus. If you know them, name one. And do this in your, in your head. You don't have to name it to me. But name it in your head one person that was happy living a backslidden life. I don't know of one, and I know of many people who have backslid, left the Lord, and their life did not get any better. They gave up something that was hard and decided to walk out, but their life didn't get any better. It didn't get less harder. Again, it was just as hard, but now they were dealing with it alone, with an uncertainty that anyone was going to help them. Think about that. Do you know one? That is happy leaving them. That was totally committed to God. And now says, yeah, my life is now better without God in my life. I don't know of one. And like I said, I know of many who have done that over the years. And so, uh, it, third, God gives us a purpose. Remember the second person, you know, that Jesus asked to follow him? And he responds, hey, listen, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus responds to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. He, get, he gave him a purpose, a greater purpose. He's telling him to reach souls. He's telling him to spread life. Don't worry about the dead. I'm giving you life. And you can spread this life, the good news Think about that. You're going to choose death or life. And so Jesus gives us purpose. When you commit your life to him, you may not have known what your purpose was before meeting him, but I guarantee you when you come to know him and you live at any particular time, you continue to follow him, he gives you purpose. I can stand here before you today and I know that in my life, God has given me purpose in my life. I'm not a mistake. I wasn't just, you know, just a happenstance, a roll of the dice. God formed me. He shaped me. He gave me purpose. And he did the same for each and every one of you. Every one of you. He's done that. In Matthew 5, 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? The one thing that salt has to do is to make things salty. That's one of its purposes. If it can't do that again, if it can't preserve, if it can't do any of those things, it loses its saltiness, then what purpose is, does it have? That's like us. If we're not committed, if we're divided, if we're more concentrated on the things behind us or anything else that distracts us from living for God, are we really living that life? Are we be, or maybe we're just losing that saltiness, losing that purpose of what God has because we've diluted it so much. Four, we're given peace. See, that's something that the world can't give. And that, I mean, if you pay attention to the panda, Kung Fu Panda, the Kung Fu, right? 
I think he had to find inner peace in the second movie. By removing all distractions and finding that inner peace, and you can take a raindrop and, you know, disseminate or move it somewhere else, and it's just an amazing thing. I get the concept what the world wants, but the world will always have it escape it. Because you can't get inner peace if you're warring against God. If you're warring against the things of God, how do you get inner peace? You can't. Jesus has come to give us peace, because here's the problem. What everything else may tell you about inner peace, by you remove the distractions, you get rid of all that stuff, and you just focus, and you do whatever you can, and you can have that inner peace. What you can't do is remove sin. You can't do that. And if you can't remove sin, you can't remove guilt. If you can't remove guilt, you're always going to be sitting there. It can go into bitterness. How can you truly have inner peace if you can't get rid of the sin? Unless you do so through Jesus. And by being committed to Jesus, Jesus gives you something the world cannot. He gives you true peace because he wipes away the sin. He removes the guilt. He says, you can now proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Guilt free. Doesn't mean you're perfect. Nor should you ever tell anyone that you're perfect because that would be a lie. Even yours truly here is not perfect. But one thing I know is that any time I've gone to the Father and asked for forgiveness, He has forgiven me at that moment. How do I know? Sometimes I may feel it, sometimes I may not. You know what I do know? He made a pact. He made a covenant through Jesus Christ that if anyone should sin, they would have an advocate with the Father. Take a look at John 14, 27. Jesus says this, before He leaves, He's talking to His disciples and He is talking to us today. Before he left to go to the cross, he says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, because they can't. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. If you have any kind of fear, you do not have peace. Not the kind that God gives. But when you have given everything to Jesus, and you are focused on him and committed and following him, you will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. Then there's also the blessings that come in life. Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Absolutely. We're given blessings upon blessings. The Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet what? Some of your needs. Yeah, right. All of your needs. All of them. What is it that you have need of? You don't have to do it on your own. God says, I know your need. I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to bless you. You remain committed to me. I know what you need. I know you need clothes on your back. I know you need a job. I know that you need to pay your mortgage or pay your rent. I know that you have to pay your taxes. I know all of these things. You remain faithful to me and see what I do. God is saying, hey, listen, just remain it and see what he will do. And he, listen, he, and it says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. According to his glorious riches. Well, that is infinite. You, no man could put a, a limit on it. For one, God could just speak it and it appears. <laughs> I mean, when you have that kind of power, I mean, there's, it's, it's just unlimited. There is nothing. He lacks absolutely no resource. And this is the God who's on your side. So is it worth it following Jesus? Yes. Probably one of the most important things of following Jesus and saying that it is worth it is that the fellowship that was once broken in the Garden of Eden, the fellowship between man and God, is restored. Wow. You can have communication with the God who created you. Is it worth it? Absolutely. It is worth it. To be completely sold out, to be committed to Him, it is absolutely worth it. You don't have to worry about being alone or abandoned because Jesus said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. He is there with you every step of the way. The problems may not change overnight because some, let's face it, sometimes we created some of those problems that we face. But even if we've created those problems, he says, I'm not going to leave you. Don't worry about it. I'm not forsaking you. We've got to work on it. 
we got to do this, we got to do that, but I'm here with you every step of the way. You don't have to face life alone. <laughs> you, don't have to remain, you don't have to rely on your own means. And that relationship that we can come before him and pray. Romans 8.15 says this, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, what? Abba, Father. Abba, Father. This is what we can cry. He did, the fellowship is just more than restored. We are now children of God. Heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Think about that. That's how far that restoration has, has gone. We can pro approach God with anything. In Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God sees your situation. He knows what you're going through. And he says, listen, is it worth it following me? Yes, for all of these and so much more that I, even, I haven't even mentioned. There's so much that God has, that gives us. Eternity, that we will live forever, that we'll be granted new bodies, I and mean, the list goes on and on and on. Is it worth it to, get, to make those sacrifices to follow Jesus? I stand before you this morning to say it absolutely is. Absolutely. And so we come to this. Jesus heading to the cross. He knew the commitment it was going to take to get there. He knew the punishment that was, he was going to go through. He even told the disciples several times he was going to be lifted up. He told them many, many times things that were going to happen, and either they didn't want to believe it, or they were blinded by it, or it was kept from them, or whatever the things may be going on. But either way, it didn't matter. He let them know. And so every time Jesus is saying this, listen, he's living it. They may have forgotten it. They may not have wanted it. Maybe they were in denial, not wanting to hear it. But Jesus knew full well what was awaiting him. Because he knew, this is why I came. He left heaven to come down. To go to the cross. To die for the sins, not his own. He knew what it meant to be committed to a mission, to a purpose. To be blamed for something that he never did. And yet he remained committed. And so we take a look at a passage like this. Knowing Jesus' mindset. No wonder he was challenging them. Because see now it's, it's the end of the journey. It's no longer in the year of popularity. When people would see the miracles. Like oh wow gut shot all over Jesus. He's amazing. No now we're ne they were coming after him now. And he knew it full well. Are you really going to follow me when it gets tough? Are you really going to speak up at work when people may ostracize you, may even co cost your job, but to say nothing when they may need to hear it? What is it that goes on in our lives? And God is saying, you need to sacrifice this. But don't worry, the trade-off is amazing. Is it worth it? It absolutely is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord God, for your mercy and grace which you have extended to each and every one of us. And those who are watching even right now at home or wherever they may be, Lord God, we understand that it is worth everything. Lord God, you have given us so much. Lord God, we thank you so much for it. We thank you for the salvation that we enjoy. Help us. If there's any way within us, Lord God, that we need to sacrifice, we need to go deeper in you, we ask right now, Heavenly Father, reveal that to us if we don't know the next step we need to take. Whatever it might be, Lord God, Father, speak to us that we know we say, yeah, I need to let go of this. 
because this is a distraction. I need to let go of that or I need to embrace all of you. Whatever it might be that you're asking us to do from having gr deeper devotions or having longer devotions or just having devotions, whatever it might be, Lord God, we ask right now, Father, that you would speak to us. Because, Lord, we do want to commit more and more of our life to you, not less and less. The world has already exacted so much of our lives and has brought in so, so much concern and worry and, and all kind of things that go on, Lord God, on a daily basis. We don't want to give any more of it to the world, but more commitment to you every single day. So, Father, we come before you and we ask for forgiveness. For those things that we may have held on to that we shouldn't. Those things that we bring before you. Because we know, Lord God, you are just and faithful. That when we confess to you, that you 